Kevin, of course, is one of the Light Lab physicians. Um, if you've already seen this presentation, then you can go make a cup of coffee. Otherwise, <laughs> please sit tight and you'll hear some very interesting data. Kevin. Thanks very much, Nick and colleagues. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to share with you some of the insights from phase one of the Light Lab uh, project. You know, Haram Bazir, our colleague, presented this recently at EuroPCR, and I think some of the information which is coming, even from the early data mine, is fascinating. So the title of the presentation is Analysis of Changes in Decision-Making Process During OCT-Guided PCI Coronary Interventions, Insights from the Light Lab Initiative. And so we're excited to kind of take you through an early look of how this workflow impacts what we do in everyday cases, utilizing a prescriptive OCT strategy to support uh, revascularization of patients percutaneously. As Richard nicely outlined, you know, there is an evolving database from Illumian studies and from, from registries that OCT really matters. It makes a difference in terms of what we do, and it potentially can impact outcomes in a meaningful way. And we're really excited to see Illumian 4 wrap up and inform us in a randomized fashion. But, but in the meantime, you know, it's been known that, that intracornea imaging during PCI affects the physician decision-making. And as shown on the right, is at least associated with reduced mortality. And I think, you know, recently in 2020, there's been yet another meta-analysis of image-guided PCI showing a reduction in hazard of, mor of mortality. So all of the data pieces really are lining up to suggest there's something incredibly meaningful in terms of how we're going to impact patients and how they do if we support their PCI with imaging. And importantly, you know, early experience is that OCT changes what we do in cases 50% of 57% of the time prior to PCI and 27% of the time post post PCI stent implantation. And so really the barriers to uptake with regard to imaging in the US are, are, are probably related to a perceived lack of benefit. Illumian 4 for OCT is going to hopefully address that in a very clear way and potential adverse impacts in the workflow. We've also taken the understanding that there's a need for training in this space. And so some part of the prescriptive MLD Max workflow that Richard nicely outlined was an effort among many of us in collaboration with Nick and other colleagues to try and make this simplified. And so we were really excited to build an easy workflow that's teachable, can be applied practically, and then implement it in a way where we could study its impact on how things go during cases with regard to the decisions we're making and hopefully someday efficiency and cost. And that's going to be looked at in the later phases. And so really the Light Lab initiative was set up to assess the utility of implementing OCT into our everyday PCI workflow. And so what did we study? As Richard nicely outlined, there's multiple phases. And what I'm going to go through today is the phase one decision-making data that we have from the early part of the trial. As you know, Light Lab was done at 12 centers with over 50 physicians, and the multi-phase aspect of this is going to allow us to ask different questions throughout the various phases. So today we're really looking at the effect of accuracy, precision, boiled down to the concept of decision-making. And so how was the study executed? I think as, as nicely pointed out already, I won't belabor this, is that it follows a prescriptive utilization of OCT, importantly pre-PCI, following a morphology and OCT-determined length and diameter strategy, using the angiographic co-registration, intratreatment to guide what we're doing with the case, and on the post-PCI pullback, making sure we optimize looking for uh, absence or presence of medial dissection and trying to optimize that position and expansion. And so when we think about who the population is, it was all PCIs by par participating physicians were potentially eligible. It was left to the, deci the decision of the physician about whether the PCI was clinically appropriate for OCT and for using the light lab workflow. And the important thing to understand is in the phase one, this is really neat the way that we played this out. You had to look at the angiogram and commit to a treatment strategy, discuss what the preparation strategy for the vessel would be, choose a stent size and choose a stent length. And then you were asked to do a pre-PCI OCT after having committed to what you do based on the angiogram and then we let our decision-making be guided by the pre-PCI OCT using much higher fidelity information, as Richard outlined earlier. And what we looked at in this particular phase one um, exercise was the effect of the OCT on decision-making in terms of what the lesion morphology was, the number of lesions we could treat, what our vessel prep strategy was, choosing a stent diameter and length based on angiography versus doing it based on our pre-PCI OCT, in post-PCI, what our vessel optimization strategy looked like in terms of post-dilation and then the additional stenting. This data was all collected prospectively 
in collaboration with our Abbott field clinical engineers who are embedded in, in our labs to help us with this project. And we came up with a really neat iPad tool, which got complete and utter granularity on every aspect of the cases that was being done. The number of data fields that were entered for every case is really amazing. I think it's gonna help us generate a lot of insight over the long term as we progress from phase one to phase two to phase three of the Light Lab program. And so looking at this initial publication, a total of 2,203 procedures were assessed during this phase. Of that, 710 of them were OCT guided and 604 followed the light lab workflow, leading to a total of 652 lesions which had both pre and post OCT that followed the workflow which were amenable for us to study. When you look at the study population, one of the things I was struck by is unlike many trials of imaging or trials of stenting, this is not a simple lesion subset. Effectively, a large number of cases involved multivessel. There was instant restenosis in upwards of 18%. The length of complexity of the stent defined as greater than 28 millimeters was 44% of patients. And there was a significant number of bifurcations and type C lesions comprised 55% of all the lesions that were studied. And so interestingly, this wasn't sort of a cherry picking type A lesions. It was applied to a real world practice where there's a significant amount of complexity. And this will give us insight in terms of how the workflow um, works with these patients and how you can readily apply it to all comers in terms of supporting practice with regard to guidance in the modern era of trying to evolve how we do PCI today. So Kevin, if I can just interject there, I mean, I think that's a point that's really worth emphasizing. This is not a first in man type cohort, straightforward lesion, something that's very easy to deliver the catheter through. This is nasty, complex, real world angioplasty. So the results of, the, of these analyses of these different phases should be directly translatable to everyday practice. Yeah, and that's something we're excited about. And the degree of complexity here is in some part related to the fact that a lot of the centers that were excited to do this and partnered with Abbott in this initiative are complex PI, PCI centers. And so the number of patients who sort of track into the long standing CTO and type C lesions, it's not surprising that we see such a, a large number there. But I think to Nick's point, it's really going to help us make conclusions about generalizability, which will be nice because this is real world in terms of the types of patients that, that are included in the analysis. Thanks, Nick. So really what we were really excited and, and I was honestly surprised to see is that OCT, OCT changed the angiographic base decisions in 88% of lesions. That's a huge number. And when you look at how this stratifies across pre-PCI OCT, it changed impact in terms of decision-making 83% of the time and a little bit less so in terms of post-PCI where it impacted decision-making 31% of the time. And this is interesting, and I wonder if this is because we took a prescriptive, do the OCT up front and act on it, if you kind of ended up getting the indices of what you wanted to do right because you looked early on in the procedure, such that almost there was a little less work to do on the back end because you knew what you were dealing with from an upfront strategy. Early on in my OCT career, I was a put the stent in and image it post person because I really thought like, as long as it's expanded well, and as long as I get, you know, the edges to be okay, I've probably done a good enough job. But, you know, as I started to move toward the MLD max workflow, at least personally, I started to see a benefit of the pre-PCI OCT. And it's amazing that this data sort of points out the fact that we use the information from the pre-run more often than we use the information from the post-run in terms of what we do. And it'll be neat to see how this may impact things like stent expansion and length of stent and some other things that will come out of later granular analyses of the data. And if I, Kevin, again, if I can just emphasize this, this is very interesting because, as you know, that there's, there is fairly widespread, if you like, ad hoc use of imaging. And some people use maybe imaging just before they're going to treat the lesion to try and assess something and don't do it afterwards. But more commonly, you would do what I think people refer to as an OCT-endorsed rather than OCT-guided PCI. Yeah. So you, you do what you want to do with the lesion. You put your stent in, then you put the OCT down and say, it looks lovely, didn't I do a great job? Whereas these data really very clearly show us that the most bang for your buck, if you like, the most impact is by looking at that pre-PCI OCT. And if you do change your strategy and do what that run tells you, there's actually usually not too much tidying up at the back end to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, with regard to Richard's vision for this, 
some part of the efficiency piece. You know, I, I get the sense we're probably going to recoup major efficiencies in the case by the fact that we have to do less steps because we got it right the first time. But that's open to analysis as we get into later parts of the program. And I'm excited to see where that goes. So color coded here are the various aspects of um, the OCT decision making, which we know will impact stent expansion in terms of identifying lesion type, vessel prep, stent diameter, and addressing under expansion. And so not surprisingly, the light lab workflow creates actionable change in what we do in addressing what we know is one of the major predictors of stent failure, things we do to get MLA as big as appropriate relative to reference vessel. And so the decision making isn't really just about, you know, looking to see it's fibrotic versus calcified versus lipidic. It actually matters with regard to maneuvering in the case, changes his decision making, changes to action to things that we know are going to impact stent expansion. And so Jason's going to go into this in great detail in the latter half of today's program, but it's really important to see that a large part of the change in decision making was really regarding the type of lesions we were dealing with. An inaccurate diagnosis of calcification drives in large part a change in vessel preparation strategy. Within the calcified lesions, 51% of the time, physicians in the program change what they were going to do. And often, 40%, 47% of the time, as color-coded here, it was a change in device. And in that 47% of cases, 49% of the time, there's a change from either a predilation with a compliant to a non-compliant balloon, movement up to cutting or scoring balloons, or potentially escalation to atherectomy or laser. And so by defining pre-PCI, what the lesion type is like, once that was done, it led to a dramatic and common change in terms of the maneuvers done to prepare the lesion. And I think this sort of harkens back to well-known understanding about how poor the angiogram is with regarding uh, how it detects and characterizes calcium. And we're sort of even starting now to think a how we might take a prescriptive approach to looking at calcium and helping us make decisions on what is an actionable degree of calcification with regard to arc, length, and thickness. And there's some evolving data in this space that's OCT-based, which hopefully help inform us when to think about atherectomy, understanding that stent expansion is sort of the at least immediate goal that we'd like to correlate what we're doing the case with. But more of that will come, I think, in the next year or so as we learn how to apply this information with regard to supporting decisions uh, for lesion prep. In cases where there was no change in vessel preparation, there was only 10% atherectomy use. And so as expected, if you see more calcium, it often leads to an escalation with regard to the type of lesion prep that was done. Notably in about 257 lesions, vessel prep was bef performed before the pre-PCI OCT. That's not surprising because when you look at the complexity of this patient subset, as we all know, Sometimes you need to prep a vessel to get the imaging catheter down. And in large part, I have a feeling that's what happened here. And as we go through the data, we should have some granularity in terms of that because that is a data field we wanted to look at as we evolve some of the data which was being collected in the study. And interestingly, you know, I always thought that if I was likely to get a stent size wrong, I probably would undersize it. But interestingly, the angiographic guidance led to inaccurate stent diameter in 38% of stented lesions and it clustered almost equally in terms of physicians oversizing by angio 16% or undersizing 22%. And this was defined as a change in the planned stent diameter of half a millimeter or more. And so I, and as an investigator in the study, I actually found myself trying to always want to be accurate. I ended up chasing my tail. I'd get a couple wrong on the back end, small, and then I'd go too big. And then finally, I just gave up and relied on the OCT, which allowed me to do this in a much more high fidelity way. But I was surprised that it clustered equally on both sides. And that was actually interesting from an information standpoint. And so as we know, the ability to detect stent under expansion enables targeted optimization in a MLD max guided image guided approach. The population of lesions that followed the light lab workflow achieved about 80% minimum stent expansion on average, as is shown in the blue boxes. And physicians in the study performed additional targeted optimization in 38% of the, of the cases, which are shown as the hash boxes. But on those, they didn't do a post-PCI OCT. So the limits of real world, unlike Illumian 4, we don't always necessarily have a final OCT run because this is a real world, world study, and it was really left up to the operator. 
a lot of times talking to the other operators in, in the in the study, a lot of times what we decide is it, you know, if kind of following the Illumin 4 protocol, if you've got 78% expansion and you take a one-to-one -one size post dilation balloon up in the area that's under expanded and you inflate it to 20 atmospheres. Using the Illumin 4 protocol, effectively you're done. I think the protocol calls for no further optimization, in some part because it's a safety measure. You don't want to take oversized balloons. And so with regard to the real world use, a lot of times the operators feel like, hey, I've done what I needed to based on our prescriptive optimization strategy. It may not change what I do further. So they go ahead and they skip a final OCT run. That happened in some part of the cases, but it's a little bit of an insight in terms of why there wasn't always a final one done because some people would articulate, if you're not gonna act on it, I further didn't characterize what was happening because I did what I was going to anyway. And so it's an important point of, of discussion and it really evolved a little bit about what we're coached to do in the Illumian 4 protocol. Importantly, post dilation was performed in 85% of lesions before the post PCI OCT. And it's kind of neat to think about the fact if you follow the pre-workflow, there's not a lot to do on the back end, as Nick alluded to. And so when we think about the light lab workflow, I think really trying to get this boiled down for a simplicity's sake in a real world population is one of the tangible benefits of the initial phase of the study. You can do it in all comers. It can be done quickly and feasible. And really following the MLD max workflow gives you a prescriptive strategy where you get good expansion most of the time up front, and it can be done in a very feasible way across multiple centers, multiple operators, I think with good effect. And so the essentials to remember from this are the OCT guidance impacted decision-making in 88% of PCI cases in this prospective data set. The majority of changes occurred during diagnosis and planning. And the population of lesions that follow the light lab guided workflow achieved 80% stent expansion on average. So the study's really been exciting to be part of because it's giving us unprecedented granularity to the volume of data collected in this real world cohort. And it shows a clear and important impact of OCT on lesion assessment, planning, and stent optimization. And Jason's gonna take us through a really cool deep dive in terms of just even the, the procedural planning with regard to uh, how we prep vessels, looking specifically at that question in the next segment of the program. So thanks very much for inviting me, Nick. This has been a transformative thing to be part of. And it's been really, really fun to see, you know, how we're doing things differently based on the pre-imaging. Cheers. Thanks very much indeed, Kevin. That was great. Really, really interesting to see those data. And um, thank you to those of you who are sending questions in. We've had quite a lot already. I was going to save them all to the end, but Kevin, I can't resist just asking you one now, just because you've literally just spoken to this point. Uh, someone has, has pointed out or noted that the expansion that was seen in the additional optimization group was 73%. So the patients yes. who had extra optimization only achieved 73%. But those who had no additional optimization, they had expansion, expansion of 84%. Can you make a little comment on that for us? Yeah, so you know, I think that what, what we're recommending from a global perspective for stent expansion is that optimal is 80%, and, you know, except, sorry, acceptable is 80%, and optimal is 90%. And so, when you look at the complexity of the lesions in this particular study, it's really important to understand that in heavily calcified arteries, 90% is great, but it can be hard to achieve that. And so I think, you know, in cases where there was 73%, a lot of times there was a maneuver to further optimize, but not necessarily maneuver to check it again, because again, from an efficiency standpoint, if you're not going to do anything different, then you may not you know, really need to know because it's not gonna change further what you do in the case, which that's the difference between this study and the Lumi where you actually have to check as part of the trial and the core lab keeps you honest because every case gets immediately reviewed. And so I think you know, the, in cases where we don't meet the uh, acceptable and optimal strategy, there was a nod to the investigators, some of whom are Lumi for investigators to try and get the stents better expanded in line to what we currently recommend regarding the MLD max workflow. Okay, that's clear, and that makes perfect sense. Um, and I think, again, that reflects clinical utility and pragmatism over perhaps uh, clinical trial utopianism. Yeah, it'll, um, it'll be interesting to see with the prescriptive Illumine 4 strategy, Nick, how often we get to 90%. That's something that many of us that are interested in this space are going to want to see. For sure. Thanks very much indeed, Kevin.